Welcome to the Shun Podcast, where we expose the religions that use shunning as a tool to control people. Today I have an interview that I did with Lindy. She's a truly amazing woman that has a lot of insight into a lot of things, and I'm sure those are hard-won lessons, uh, you know, kind of through living a trying life. You're going to hear a story about a young marriage in The Witnesses, a story that unfortunately echoes many others. You also hear a mother's struggles after becoming a mom and suffering postpartum depression, and then the spiral that led to her waking up and leaving the cult behind. You're also going to hear what it's like to have your own daughter shun you, and you're going to learn what she's done to help try to reach her daughter someday. So let's go ahead and get to know Lindy. My name is Lindy. I was, I am 43 years old. I was a Jehovah's Witness, and now I am shunned. All right, Lindy. So then how did you come to be one of Jehovah's Witness in the first place? Um, what age did that happen? Well, it happened when I was 10 years old. Um, I've kind of thought back to this of what attracted my mom to the religion. And one factor was uh, she had grown up in the same town for most of her life. And then she met my stepdad and he did land leasing and um, sold right of ways to land. So he moved around like every six months to two years. And so immediately after they were married, we moved to a different area where she didn't have her family around. And also when she was young, um, she was like 19, her 15 year old sister died in a car accident. And I remember her saying, um, everybody told her, well, God needed an angel. And that never really made sense to her. So I think that um, she was drawn to it just for the teaching of the resurrection. And that made a lot more sense than what she was taught. So, uh, we moved to this new area and I was in school with, in fourth grade with a boy named Jason and my little sister was in first grade with his sister. And my mom approached their mother and asked if she wanted to help her with a Christmas party. And that mother said, um, well, I can't because I'm a Jehovah's Witness. Would you like to know more about that? My mom said, sure. <laughs> so so she started studying with her. Um, and I would say within a year, my mom was baptized. She rushed into the baptism because she was pregnant with my youngest sister, her fourth child, and oh, wow. she had the RH negative blood factor. And there was a good chance the baby would need a blood transfusion. So she went ahead and got baptized so she could refuse it on the grounds of being a Jehovah's Witness. And she had a home birth, so it wouldn't be forced upon her. Oh, and she was like, it, yeah, it really sinks in on how, how much mind control was there already for her to be willing to let her, the baby die. In just know, a instead year. Of, <laughs> I know. Wow. She went in full force. So... So that, that's, uh, my baby sister was okay, luckily. And that seemed like, you know, Jehovah protecting her. That's kind of what the thought was. So right. that kind of strengthened it. And from my perspective, um, the family, the mother and the two kids would come over and study with me and my sister. We do the Bible storybook and, um, this 10 year old boy, Jason was the nicest boy I had ever met in my life because, He'd study with me and, you know, say, so, you know, who created Adam and Eve? And I would say, Jehovah. And he'd go, good job. You know, it was like, wow, I never had a boy so nice, you know, and encouraging. And everybody at the meetings were so nice. And the whole thing with the paradise was like extremely enticing to a 10 year old. Sure. And, and, and I felt, I mean, I was in wholeheartedly immediately as well. Like it just sounded so good and I felt lucky to know it. And, and we were just, yeah, immediately in. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like it. I mean, you know, obviously your mom went in full force, but, uh, you even had a peer, you know, to, to help you along. That's, that's a very yes. hard thing to resist. Um, yes. So then, uh, what did it mean to you back then? You know, you're studying with this this other boy and, and you know, the the paradise sounds so nice. Um, did that how did that change your life? Because you know, you're 10 years old and yeah. you, you were in the quote world and now you're you know going this new direction. Well, um, like 
I remember finding out, you know, we couldn't celebrate holidays and that was like really disappointing. But my mom said like, uh, she never liked the holidays anyway. There was so much stress and pressure and, and you're just giving gifts for, you know, no good reason. And now we will have, you know, plenty of other times that we get gifts. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, okay, I can, I can deal with that. And, and then when I found out, you know, it made Jehovah sad and, upset if we did holidays. I was like, okay, I'm done with holidays. And my real father, um, picked up me and my sister, I think it was like her seventh birthday. And he took us to his sister's house to have a surprise party. And I locked her and I in the bathroom crying hysterically and would not come out because I did not want to make Jehovah angry and him like kill us. So it was like that immediate too, that I was willing to give up everything because I would you know, because the promise of the paradise. And and I remember right from the get-go, it was coming soon. Like, Oh, it's it always coming soon. <laughs> yes, yes. So it was like, it, it didn't even seem like um, a big sacrifice really to me at that time because, sure. you know, I we were just lucky that we found out about it like just in time and the end was coming and the, you know, having the, the elephant and the dolphin and the lion were going to definitely make up for missing the holidays. <laughs> but but immediately too, my grandparents, um, when they heard about this, they told my mom, like, this is a cult. And I remember them coming to visit one holiday, which really made my mom mad because they were like coming just to try to, you know, basically like Satan trying to stumble her. And she was very mad and offended that they called it a cult. And Uh, My grandparents tried to get us to celebrate and me and my sister wouldn't, but my stepdad and little brother did. So it it like did an immediate divide on the family, you know, like right from the get go. And all my relatives I started to see as bad and, you know, tried to trick us and stuff like that. So, so it was very quickly, uh, very quickly, my whole entire universe changed and everything good about my own personality or what I thought were my, you know, good things like loving animals and loving babies and being just myself wasn't good enough anymore. And all the goals that we had, you know, put on us by the religion really took hold. And I really went for those things to please everybody. Wow. That's a, that's a really interesting point you make there at the end. Um, you know, what a healthy outlook it is to accept yourself as you are and mm-hmm. to to love yourself for the good qualities that you have and then suddenly to be thrust into an environment where oh yeah none of that matters um all that matters mm-hmm. is that you perform these certain steps or do these certain things or, or or be what we want you to be and then all of a sudden um you're no longer okay uh, mm-hmm. you're not good yeah. enough that that's a that's an interesting point you know to to experience that even as a 10 year old you know that's a yeah. lot yeah, it is. And and also the whole thing of our family dynamic being wrong. Like it's already hard having step families and all that, but to have immediately the separation of my stepdad from my mom. My mom got a lot of extra attention because she was with an unbelieving mate and she would, you know, get a lot of um commendation for going to the assemblies with us and not him and like it I could see she got a lot of uh, good. Um, I don't know what the word is. Reinforcement. Good feedback. Yeah. <laughs> reinforcement. Like, you know, just what she needed to, to make herself feel better about moving around, you know, immediate yeah. recognition for her sacrifices and how hard it was and things like that. So our, our whole family really changed in a huge way and just got like, really, I feel like so dysfunctional. And I would always envy the families that, we're all in the truth. You know, they seem to have a great yeah. time at assemblies and we were miserable at assemblies and all that kind of thing. So I definitely had the goal of that's the kind of family I wanted in the future is like everybody in, in the religion, in the truth. And that would just be so fabulous. Like I always imagined that just as the perfect family life. If everybody goes to the assembly happy and, you know, that facade that they put on, that's what I wanted. <laughs> yeah, that, no, that makes sense. Now, how did mm-hmm. your, how did your stepdad handle it? You know, because this was a huge change very quickly. So, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, you were just a kid, so you may not be privy to, to what that was like for him, but 
um you know any insights there as to how i mean because he that that's got to be insane to watch your wife you know just suddenly flip a switch and change so much and then your you know your daughter's following along you know yeah. so quickly your stepdaughter yeah at first he would he he wouldn't go or anything so my little brother and sister they got to have birthdays and christmas and he would spoil them like in a huge way so that made a lot of tension for me and my other sister. Um, you know, we would be on my mom's side and they would be on that side, but, um, like eventually he would go to some meetings and, you know, he thought the idea of, um, women being submissive and, you know, her trying to win him over without a word, you know, he would kind of like, Hmm, aren't you supposed to be doing this? So she kind of got irritated when he started like learning more (laughs) of (laughs) how she's supposed to behave. But, um, like we moved around a lot, so different places would have different vibes, but a lot of times somebody would come and study with them and, um, you know, he never ended up getting baptized. He always got to do like basically whatever he wanted to do with everybody still treating him really, really nice. Plus he had a decent job with decent money. So he was able to do more for people, you know, and he ended up, he hired a lot of. Jehovah's Witnesses. So I feel like he was almost treated better than any Jehovah's Witness was. He got away with a lot. You know what I mean? Yeah, he got to and ride the fence. He got to ride yes, you know, both sides of the fence, I guess. I, major say. fence rider. Yes. And at, and towards um, towards the time that I was waking up, um, I would find things out. And I thought, you know, he could really help our family, you know, like come back together. This could be really good. So I would tell him things I learned. And he was the type of person that would defend them to the death, even though he had no idea what he was talking about. He would say what I was saying wasn't true. That's not what they say. I could send him links to show him that's exactly what they say. And he would still be like, nope. So it ended up like he was really brainwashed by it, mm-hmm. but he still never committed to it. It's so, it's yeah. really bizarre. Some of the most dangerous uh, people out there are the people who never fully committed. So they don't yes. know what it was really like. So exactly. you'll see them in, in comments often uh, under you know news articles that criticize um, Jehovah's Witnesses or YouTube videos or whatever. You'll see um, these people who... They they were they weren't good Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean that's just all there was to it. They were mm-hmm. you know Jehovah's Witnesses wouldn't claim them, but yes, if it came time for you know to defend Jehovah's Witnesses, they would step up and defend them with these stories that aren't accurate, that simply are not an accurate portrayal of life as one of Jehovah's Witnesses because they weren't fully committed. So exactly. They never had the same pressure. They never had the same expectations and they always got love bombed their whole life. So, (laughs) right, right. Yeah. It was a frustrating situation. And my sisters, uh, my, all my siblings never got fully in. So, um, for a long time they were kind of fence riders too. Like they just thought they weren't good enough to be in it, you know, in their own minds. They're like, I know it's the truth, but I just don't feel like I can live up to it. But eventually, as they got older and I spoke to them and they did some of their own research, they kind of realized like, oh, well, there's a whole bunch of things that aren't right in it. And it had to do with their own experiences and their own journeys, too. But but they but still every Jehovah's Witness that, you know, we grew up knowing as a family still talk to them and not me. Oh, of course. Of course. Yes. So that's the way it goes. Because you committed and they didn't. Yep. (laughs) Exactly. At 14 years old. <laughs> <laughs> so then, um, so how did things progress from that time? You know, you're 10 years old, you're starting to study, uh, you mm-hmm. get baptized at 14. Um, you know, what was kind of the trajectory there um, as far as, you know, life went? Because, I mean, it seems like you bought the worldview uh, very quickly that the witnesses gave you because you were seeing your mm-hmm your family and outsiders as, you know, these scary people who were trying to, you know, rip you away from the truth. What about, you know, um, at school or at the meetings, you know, how was life going for you and this interim time where you're, you're building up and progressing toward baptism? Well, um, so like with my relatives, since we started moving around a lot, we didn't really have a chance to see them a lot. So that was kind of, you know, not a huge issue. We weren't around to do much with anybody. So, But we just knew, like, I just knew in my head they would try to, like, 
trip me up with questions or, you know, I just wasn't close to them. That was the bottom line. It was like, they, they didn't really count as family. Now we had this new family. And, um, as we moved around, it was nice to go somewhere and have an instant family. Like within a week of moving somewhere new, Mm -hmm. we would have like a sleepover with friends, you know? So that part seemed pretty lucky. And I was homeschooled. And, um, part of that was, uh, like the only entertainment I had was going out in service. Basically it was either home doing things, taking care of the kids. I remember your wife's interview. She was similar where she Mm -hmm. took care of the, my youngest sister was 10 years younger. So I took care of her a lot, studied with her. I always had a nice sister in the hall that would come and study with me. So I liked having that. So like, you know, for our lifestyle of moving around a lot, it did bring a lot of comfort to have this, you know, attention from people and friends immediately. So, yeah. so I, I felt very committed. And then all the people, you know, that go out in service all the time, they're real into it. And that would be my outlet is going out in service a few times a week. So I would try to, um, I don't remember if it was called auxiliary pioneer when you were, before you were baptized, but I would try to do that. And then when I was baptized, I would auxiliary pioneer and, just that was my social life too. So I didn't have yeah. any other viewpoints really from school or anything like that. Yeah. Wow. Something you touched on with homeschooling really struck me. And that I've always seen homeschooling, you know, parents would talk about uh, doing it as a way to protect their children. Mm-hmm. But what I never really realized is so as that child, because they have essentially uh, made your life that much more closed off, now, when you go to things like the meetings or to out in field service to knock on doors, like those things now carry even more what more weight. They're more special because mm-hmm. that's the only place you're going to get any socializing. Yes. So I, I guess I hadn't really thought about it from that perspective. Not only are they isolating you, but in doing so, they are propping up or making bigger these other aspects of life that they want you to see because those are the only things that have any, you know, provide any stimulus to your life. Yes. And then, um, and then, um, uh, another odd part of it is my stepdad, he, he wasn't really all the way in. So he wouldn't let me go out in service every day. I would have gone every day if I could have just, you know, to get out of the house, Yeah. but he would only let me go like twice a week. So of course with a kid, that makes you want to do it more, you know, like, yeah. oh, when I'm older, I'm going to pioneer, you know, because <laughs> yeah. now I'm not allowed to. But when I'm allowed to, I'll go out all the time. Like, so, so funny what saying no to a kid makes them want to do. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And usually, you know, usually when, when that's spoken of, that's spoken in talk context of, you know, uh, don't tell your daughter not to date that guy because, of course, she's going to want to date that guy. Or, right. or, or, you know, that bad boy or whatever, but instead it's, it's field service. <laughs> field service. Yep. That was my, that was my exciting time. Wow. And also during that time, like, um, I was trying to get, well, that was like, uh, at 14, I got baptized and we lived in Massachusetts and I really had the goal in mind of marrying this 10 year old that I had met Jason. I, his family was all in, they seemed so nice and they had it all together. And I knew I had to be very spiritual to, you know, be able to marry him. So that was one of the things at the forefront of my mind at all times is like, I have to be good enough to win, you know, a a Jehovah's witness boy with an elder dad and all this. So, you know, you had to really keep your standards up because there were a lot of spiritual girls that, would be in his path. And I had to be on that level. (laughs) Yeah. And, and I would pray all the time. Like, um, you know, I, I wasn't really seeing my real dad much because, you know, he wasn't a Jehovah's witness. He'd try to get us to celebrate holidays, you know, the nerve of him, he would still send us presents like, Oh, Christmas presents. Doesn't (laughs) he know we don't celebrate, you know, and of course I'd be happy to get presents, but also like, you know, have to have that attitude of like, he's just not respecting me. (laughs) Right. um, But having, and then having a stepdad that wasn't the nicest, Jehovah was like my real dad to me, you know? So I would, I would sometimes pray like all day, just like 
almost like, you know, your own little phone call to someone who will listen. And I can't even imagine like the stuff I used to say, cause it's like teenage <laughs> ranting, sure. but while I'm doing laundry, please help me to be loving to my family and not mind, you know, doing this. I want to be a good daughter. And but, I mean, it was just a constant thing. So being lonely and homeschooled and all that made me really, you know, uh, make Jehovah something different in my mind than even what, uh, the average Jehovah's witness does. <laughs> right. But also you were, you were super sincere. Yeah. You can see yes. that through all this, that you, you really believe this, this was it for you. Yes, um, absolutely. I mean, you, you were making plans, you know, early on to get married and, to, you know, do yes. all these things to have this, this cohesive family where everybody was a witness and yes. Um, yeah. So then how did things uh, progress as you, you know, went through your teenage years into young adulthood? How did things go? Well, so I ended up moving to Ohio where um, Jason lived and I became a nanny for a family that went to the hall, lived with them. And I started like officially dating Jason. I think we were 17. Um, very, very young. We got engaged when he was still in school, which is kind of hilarious. <laughs> um, uh, we, I think we dated a year and then we got married. I think we were 19. It's so hard to remember ages. It's, it's bizarre. I tried to think back and I don't remember the exact year, but I'm pretty sure we were both just 19 when we got married. So, um, you know, I, I, set my goals and I attained them. And I was so excited to finally have this, you know, wonderful family life and everything that I thought it was going to be as a Jehovah's witness. And, um, people would always call him little Jesus. Like he was always so nice to everybody. And, uh, <laughs> really? just, yes, <laughs> yes. He was that boy in the congregation and wow. it was a small hall. So, um, you know, all of our friends around our age were really close. It was a fun group. We really liked hanging out together. That was like what I would say is the fun times of sure. my youth. You know, I had more freedom than I'd ever had being a nanny and had a car and got to go to Jason's family on the weekends and stuff like that. So that, that time period seemed like, um, like, I don't know, like life was going good. It was going where it should go. And then after we got married, um, of course, we stopped hanging out with people. Like when you don't need a chaperone everywhere you go, you don't have as many friends to hang out with. <laughs> and everybody else was doing their own thing with getting married and stuff like that. Like oh, I yeah. think within two years, almost every young person our age was married at that kingdom hall. And I started seeing like the things that weren't so good. Like we go to the meeting and I'd sit by myself most of the time because he had, you know, uh, the sound to do or the books or the territories or, you know, whatever responsibilities he'd have. And sometimes I would look around for him and I couldn't even find him. And I found out he would like hide in the bathroom stall. Like he was so, he had so much pressure on him all his life to be this, you know, oh. perfect that he, he was really stressed out. And I did not see that. And after assemblies, like during the whole assembly, he would get really down on himself and feel like we weren't doing enough. We weren't doing enough personal study. We weren't doing enough service. And, you know, it was, well, he was super sincere not, too. Yes. Yes. It was not what I had envisioned. And we were very poor because he worked for his family and, you know, they're just a lot of the brothers worked for them and there wasn't a lot of money. So he actually was able to get a job with my stepdad doing the oil and gas. Um, at that time, it was cell phones with cell phone land leasing. So we moved from Ohio to Texas, which was like a shock to everybody. You know, Jason was a ministerial servant and moving up the ladder there and it was very upsetting for his mother. And, you know, just it was a big upset. And I think people really thought he made a you know big mistake with me because you know, otherwise he wouldn't have done this. You know, it was, we were definitely felt very judged at that time, but oh, you're taking little <laughs> Jesus away. <laughs> I know. I mean, come on. <laughs> a lot of nerve. And he has a lot of family there around that area. So, you know, it was a lot of people upset. So we, we ended up moving and going to a new hall. And that was the first time in his life he'd ever gone to a new hall. And it was a, a big hall in Texas with I think a few congregations there and, um, 
you know, instead of like, I think our hall in Ohio had like 70 people and this one had probably like 230 and it, you know, we weren't love bombed, you know, we were already in it and people weren't that friendly and it was really bizarre to him. I had seen it already with moving around that not all halls mm -hmm. are the same and same love and stuff, but I think it really affected him and not being a ministerial servant. Like, he had a hard time just sitting there at the meetings like, hello, that's what I've been doing all my life. It's not so fun listening to the same thing over and over, but, <laughs> but, yeah, but it really was a struggle for him. So we ended up settling, um, in Oklahoma. He, my dad had some work there and then we ended up, he quit working for my dad and started a business with another brother so we could just stay put. And he did quickly, you know, make ministerial servant again there and, you know, started working toward that goal again and felt better about himself, but still the constant, you know, depression and pressure of not feeling good enough. And, and I also felt like we never really could communicate because I'm a very open person and, you know, you marry someone, they're supposed to be your best friend. So I would like confess to him things like from when I was a kid, things that I would do, like sometimes me and my sisters would just, yell cuss words at each other just for fun like because it was funny. <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> yeah it was really fun like sh -sh 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 -sh. <laughs> and and he would just be like like look at me like oh my gosh and I was like did you ever do that and he'd be like no no and then like oh situations would come up and I try to talk to him and he'd get out the bound volume to uh you know, give me counsel and, oh, it would be so annoying to me because it's not being real. Like, like our life, it was either silence or mock assembly parts. It seemed like, like I was supposed to be like, oh, well, thank you for showing me this dear husband, you know? And, <laughs> and so it felt like very not real. So that was a struggle, but you know, the end's coming. It really doesn't matter who you marry. Soon you're going to all look like Adam and Eve and be perfect. So you just hang in there and soon everything will be fine. You know, that was kind of what I was betting on at that time, just yeah. hanging in there. Yeah. I can, I gotta say, I, I kind of feel for him because it seems like he was never allowed to be himself. Uh, I mean, no. well, okay. None of us were in the cult. I yeah. Mean, all of us, you know, to varying degrees, had to stifle who we were. But it really sounds like his life kind of was, you know, like an assembly part. And that he just, uh, you know, did the Watchtower thing always. Which, yes. You know, like you were, you were saying, you know, you wanted to be real. And I'm not, it, it almost sounds like he didn't have anything else. He was just like yes. a little robot, which is very sad. Um, it is. It really I, I, is. Yeah, I and I, you know, I can identify with some of that myself um, a, a little bit. I, I, I still, I always struggled with. I, I would always beat myself up for cussing. That was a big thing that I, I struggled with <laughs> from the time I was a kid. But I, you know, <laughs> I knew better than to do it around my parents or at the the meetings. But uh, you know, I always struggled with that. But you, you see, it seems like he just, he just bought it on a level that was. Uh, uh, yeah, just just very, very sad. I, I, I hope I don't know what his situation is right now, but I hope someday he finds who he is, because that's I do, no too. To live. And we'll go that's into awful. it more as yeah. the story goes on, because, you know, um, we had a child together. So, you know, I I still do know what his life is like and, you know, see it. And it's definitely just stifling emotionally and in every other way, having that pressure on you at all times. And, well, and I found it is. And I found like so much was just fake. Like uh, one time we went to the meeting and it was all icy and stuff. And, and I had my heels on and stuff, but he jumped out of the car and I got out and I was like, Whoa. And he ran to help other sisters in because <laughs> that was what he's supposed to do. And I slipped and I was so oh, no. irritated, you know, but it was like, I don't know. He was, he was nice, as nice to me as he was to everybody else. And even when we were divorced, he was still, you know, somewhat nice to me. Like he couldn't really, he was never real, but it did always seem like he was exactly though, exactly what the cult told him to be. Like some people said, well, you guys were extreme. Like I was extreme also when I was in, but I did not take anything further than 
what they told us to do, you know? Yeah. He he was the perfect good Jehovah's Witness, and he wasn't taking things too far as far as what we were told to do. He just and, and did what he was told him. to do. You know, it got yes. him hiding in a bathroom because he's under so much pressure. He's freaking I out know. and depressed. And yes, yeah, that's just... and hardly any time to do anything. Like you go to work, come home, eat dinner real quick, uh, and then he'd have to like prepare for the meeting. And then after the meeting, come home and count the money and do the. I mean, he always had all his life was consumed by stuff they were having him do, and he would always say yes. So it was it was very consuming. Yeah. But um, he loved he loved it because, you know, like I remember you said in your story and me saying like that's where you got all your self-esteem. Yep. So without that, he did not even know how to be. Yeah. You so. only exist in the eyes of others uh, yes. or in the eyes of the cult. So you can't yes. you can't risk um, having cussing fights <laughs> with, <No. laughs> with, with your siblings, um, because if you were to get caught and you were to to get in trouble, then I mean you could lose your entire identity, and that's terrifying. It is. Um, and, and one other story that was just hilarious, like me and my little sister, she was very like me, just real like boisterous, and to me, to me, funny. Some people don't find us funny, but we do. But um, one time we were talking, and we were like, um, "What is the worst thing somebody ever called you?" And like, uh, you know, it could be like the B word or something like that. And, and Jason was like, um, one time when I was, you know, 13, my mom called me a little jerk and we just started laughing. (laughs) He's like, what? Like, that's the bad thing. And, and he was like almost in tears. And so, so because of this, you know, what he viewed marriage to be and how I would treat him and respect him and all that. And I was more like real, I think it, I was a very big disappointment to him and, yeah. and I made him cry a few times just by being myself, being funny, not taking things so serious, but yeah, on the, like the, the bottom line is I really do feel for him. I really do yeah. hope that someday he finds the kind of freedom in life to be himself. I do. <laughs> yeah. That dude needs a hug. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> something, something real. I mean, that's, that's, yes. that that's very uh, very, very sad. So, so then how did things, you know, um, progress, you know? Okay. Well, this is where it gets interesting. (laughs) Um, so I'd actually had a couple miscarriages and, um, you know, being, being in the cult at all the meetings and all that, it was very lonely and boring. And he was always, you know, at the sound booth or stuff. So I didn't even have him to sit by with the meeting. So I thought, you know, it would be so nice to have a baby. And, when, when I was younger and my little sister was a baby, I used to walk her around the conventions and I used to pretend people would think she was my kid, which, you know, would be ridiculous because I was 11. But it was fun to have that kind of attention and a little baby to hang out with. So um, I finally got pregnant in Oklahoma with my daughter and I was so excited. I was worried about miscarrying, but um, this one went along fine and my mom had had home births and my sister had home births and we, we didn't have insurance and felt like a home birth would be a good way to go. Um, so we found a midwife in the phone book and started going to her and she was a little odd, which is pretty normal for, you know, some midwives to be a little bit like holistic or, you know, just a little Mm -hmm. bit weird. She had like six kids and, Um, you know, but she was just our midwife. So we went with her and we told her about being Jehovah's witnesses and how we wouldn't take blood if that became an issue. And she said that was fine and everything and everything was going along. Okay. And when I was like seven months, um, I went to her office and she was feeling my abdomen and she said, Hmm, you know, the baby's not head down yet. And we kind of expect that, but I can feel her head over on this side and huh, let me see. Oh, your baby doesn't have a skull. Like, uh, what? And she, she was like, yeah, I, I don't feel a skull, but don't worry. They can live a few hours. They're not that ugly. Let me show you in this book. And I was just what? like, oh, yeah, what? Like I was immediately like, uh, just totally freaked out crying. I left. My mom followed me. She was with me at that appointment. We got in the car. She said, 
let's just go and get an ultrasound and figure something out. She called around and got an ultrasound place to open that night and just meet us there. And I was, you know, hysterical and a mess. And we uh, went to the ultrasound, found out I was having a girl and she was fine and her head was down. So it was very bizarre that wow. she would even say that. Yeah. So horrible. yeah, just weird. So I was like, I am not going back to her. She emailed a few times and I told her, no, I am not coming back. She goes, you won't get your money back. I said, I don't care. We're not coming back to you. And she'd also, an odd thing is she would tell me like, um, cause I was swelling, like we might have to induce, which was really weird. Cause you don't induce with a home birth. You don't, you know, that's dangerous. So my mom always thought that was weird. So so I ended up having to try to find another midwife and I did. And we told her the story of what happened and she goes, Oh, well she is that lady we were going to, she's a Wiccan. She's a witch. And that sent shivers up my spine. Like I still, I don't know for a fact, but I feel like she was going to try to take the baby. I feel like she, she had something about us being Jehovah's witnesses and was thinking, she would, because she had mentioned she couldn't get pregnant and she really wanted more babies. I don't know. It was very strange. I still don't know the real answer or if that was going to happen, but that's how it made me feel. Like, yeah, regardless of whether she was a Wiccan or not, there was something wrong there. <laughs> yeah, there was something <laughs> There's something off. very and, weird there. Yeah, and I have nothing against Wiccan or, you know, different types of spirituality. Sure. So, But at that time, it's just like... um you know, it seemed like the opposite of Jehovah's Witnesses would be that. Yeah, and yeah. and it did seem like something was off. So so that was very stressful. And I ended up, you know, finding the new midwife. But, but the day I went into labor, her assistant came and I never met her. And she's the one who, like, was there when she was first checking me. So it, just everything was very stressful because it was uncomfortable. And my labor ended up being over 24 hours. Her head was turned the wrong way. So it was back labor. I did not sleep. It was basically, it was traumatic and no drugs. You know, I had her at home. Shoot. So when she finally, you know, when she finally came out and they put her in my lap, I was, I don't even, I can't even explain like how I felt. I was, I was like out of my mind at that point. And I was just like, what do I do with it? I, I didn't even have that like, oh my gosh, my baby. It was just so like, I was like, just get it out. You know, it was, <laughs> it was very, very traumatic. And then, yeah. um, she ended up being a very stressed out baby, probably from everything that I had gone through. Oh, an important fact is during that time, it was in 89 or 98, sorry, 98. Um, that is when they had a little snippet in the watchtower about, well, it appears that the generation of 1914 that would no, by no means pass away, we have new light on that and new understanding. We can't say that that's the generation that won't pass away and that people living then will still be alive. You know, they had a little part. And I remember sitting at the meeting and asking Jason, like, does this mean like, you know, people like my great grandma will still be alive? Is that what they're saying? And he's like, yeah, yeah. And it almost like went over everybody's head, I felt. But I thought, what? You know, that was what I was taught from the get-go. I was worried the whole time I was pregnant that Armageddon would come. And I would have to hike up mountains being pregnant. You know what I mean? Right. Like, they that... kind of slipped that in there pretty, pretty uh, slyly. <laughs> Didn't they? Yeah. They really did. Oh, but yeah. That... Remember this, this thing we've always used as a prophecy to pinpoint when the end's going to come? Eh. <laughs> yeah. Just forget <laughs> maybe, about it. Maybe how, not. How could you really say that? We're not supposed <laughs> to say that. Like it was, but that hit me, I think, really hard, and I didn't even know it. So, so after the traumatic birth and everything, um, she also had, um, uh, colic from seven to 11 every night she would scream. Um, the pressure right from the get go, bring her to the convention a week later, which I did. Oh, she wow. needs to be out in service from the get go, you know, Bible training. There's not too soon of a time to start that. And it was, I felt so much pressure and I also did not want to take her out in service. And I started worrying that, you know, like she was so little and fragile, like she could die. Anything could happen, you know, babies, you know, they can just fall and die. And like, I was, I didn't want to take her out in the car and, and I just felt very stressed out and I wasn't sleeping at all because she was 
you know, high strung and crying a lot. And I started, this was postpartum depression, which I did not know. I started feeling like something was wrong with me. I was not good enough. For some reason, I just did not feel like being a Jehovah's Witness anymore. I did not feel like having this pressure on me anymore. I could not handle it. But she would be better off without me because having a mother like that, like that, that is just terrible for her to have a mother like that, you know, to have someone who doesn't want to commit to Jehovah and do everything they're supposed to do. So, I mean, thinking back to that time, like it was just, I I was, I was crazy. I would say I just lost it. Like I was not myself. I could not sit still and watch a movie. I could not read a book. My mind was racing all the time. And now I realize like I was going through like a manic episode. Oh, so it was... a potential ignorant question coming up. Um, I, I, I have to admit, I, I don't know a lot about postpartum depression. Um, mm-hmm. And obviously people can, can experience that who were never Jehovah's witnesses, but yes, I, I think I just wanted to ask do you think that because you keep mentioning this pressure um, mm-hmm. to to be this good witness, do you think that it was at least partially brought on by the fact that you were one of Jehovah's Witnesses and had this this huge weight of you know bringing a life into this world that is going to end any day now and um, having to you know, essentially, not literally, but baptized this little baby into this this thing that was so big and required so much. You know, do you think that 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 added pressure maybe was what triggered it, or um, is that not how it works? I well, from what I understand now, like uh, a lot of times, traumatic births okay. will push somebody into it, and it's it's really a lot about hormones, a lot of. Yes, um, I've heard that. A, like, a, yeah, a lot of people go through it for various reasons, but for sure, the whole stress of being a perfect Jehovah's Witness to be a perfect mom was always there. And that's what led me to make the bad decisions that I made from that point on. It okay. was, so, so the postpartum depression happened just because that can happen, but also I did not get help because I didn't address the postpartum depression. It was, I internalized it all as just being a bad witness, like not being good enough. And I hadn't done anything bad, but because I felt in my own heart and mind, something was different. That, that is what I attributed everything to. Not, not that, you know, um, that I was going through something medically, you know? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It always gets back to being a witness because that dominates um, everything, everything in your entire life. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, um, so I was, I was going through that and I felt out of my mind and I knew, um, Jason and my daughter, they would be better off without me. Like I, I almost was suicidal, but I didn't feel right about that. And I just felt like I couldn't be a Jehovah's witness again. And mm-hmm. because I knew, the rules. Like I'm such a rule follower that I did it to a T. I knew that you would have to commit adultery to be able to be free from your marriage. So I did that, which is embarrassing and shameful to admit, but it was seriously for the purpose of like, I wasn't trying to find a boyfriend or anything, but I had started talking to someone on the evil, wicked computer internet. You know, back then it was like, (laughs) So, such warnings, you know, yes. and, and I remember just getting a little ping at night and like talking to someone, telling them, you know, my struggles and them being compassionate. And so it was, it was easy to find somebody to, you know, just, uh, basically get me out of the situation. And so Jason would be free to remarry. And, um, yeah, so I, well, let me, <clears throat> let me acknowledge that, um, okay. <laughs> you've, you've already, you know, I, I know you, you say you're embarrassed and, you know, feel ashamed to, to, to say this, but what was it that you found online when you talked to that person was that you found someone Yeah, you know, yes, you did break a rule, 
but you found someone who actually listened to you and gave you some emotional support in a situation, you know, postpartum depression is, is overwhelming for, you know, any woman who experiences it. But when you experience it in a culture where there is very little uh, emotional health, um, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it sounds like, you know, your husband probably wasn't able to give you much. Um, Not at all. It doesn't sound like he, it sounded like he was a a desert emotionally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're in a, an organization that, you know, I didn't ask you uh, how they handled, you know, I know I've heard stories, let's just say of women. I think my mom even had a miscarriage or two um, in the organization. And the way that some people in the congregation address that is just horrific. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, you know, well, why should you be sad? You know, you've got the hope and all this stuff. So they, they're really emotionally, um, uh, invalidating. And yes. so, you know, I can only imagine in that, in that circumstance, you know, what you did was a very human thing to do. It's not something to destroy yourself over because it's, it's an awful place. You didn't ask to be put in that position. You didn't ask to have postpartum depression. You didn't ask, you know, for this traumatic birth, you know, these are just things that happened. And, you know, sometimes things in life happen and, uh, don't have to be, you know, unfortunately we came from a, a society where everything was moralized. Um, mm-hmm. yes. and, and everything was, you're a bad person, which is what shame is. You know, shame is guilt is I did a bad thing. Shame is I'm a bad person. And you know what you did, you know, obviously, um, you know, you get to feel how you feel, you know, and if you don't feel good about it, that's fine. But, uh, you know, for yourself, but I just, I just wanted to put it out there that, you know, what you did was a very human thing, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and, um, one of the things I I had to learn, you know, when I left was to be able to have compassion for myself, for being a human being and, you know, not always making the 100% perfect uh, decision according to their rules, uh, from the environment that we grew up in. So, um, yes, I just, I, I hope you can hear that. (laughs) I do. I really, really do. And I really, I I look back and I don't hold, I don't blame myself, but I do take accountability. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Taking responsibility for what you did. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's certainly But like I've told my, some of my friends about this and they're, they crack up like you are such a rule follower. (laughs) You had to even get out the way they said. And, And it's so true for all of us. Like, the yeah. self-fulfilling prophecies, yes. the self-fulfilling self-destruction, like yes. all of that we do to ourselves because that's what they said. Yeah. They said you would meet somebody on the internet if you spend time on the big bad internet and y- that's how most people cheat on their spouse. So I had a handbook of how to do it. You know what I mean? And they know that's going to happen <laughs> because they know they produce human beings without any e- emotional intelligence <laughs> or support or support yeah. or anything like they 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 know what they produce and they know yes. what the outcomes are going to be you know that's why they tell you not to read apostate literature because they know that they're full of it and if you read it they that you would see it so yes you know it's it's um they do <laughs> set those things up very well yes yes and immediately like immediately i told my husband well I cheated on you. So now you're free to remarry. (laughs) And, you know, he was, he was upset and like that dang internet, you know, like I remember him (laughs) just being really mad at the internet. And I just thought, you know, I, I just thought, well, good now, you know, you're free. I did it. I took, I took the bullet on this one. So find somebody good and marry them. You know, I, I really just felt like, that gets me out of the picture so that you guys can be okay. And I remember I even asked my mother to adopt my daughter. Like, and she was only eight months old. Like it, you know, it was just like thinking back, this is insanity. Like I would have never behaved like that under normal circumstances, but, but yeah, all the pressure of that. So then, so then I moved out and I was still getting my daughter like, when he went to work, but very quickly that changed. And he started taking her to other witnesses who were told not to let me see her. So immediately she was taken from me. My mom was totally supportive in that. Uh, My mom thought I needed to talk to a therapist, but of course a Jehovah's witness therapist. So 
this was in Oklahoma and she lived in Arizona and she flew me out to Laughlin, Nevada, which is near where she lived and, um, had this Jehovah's witness therapist meet with me. Now she wouldn't talk to me cause I was bad at that point. And she like dropped me off at this hotel <laughs> and who wouldn't stay talk? with me. Your mom My wouldn't mother. talk to you. Okay. Yeah. So she was shunning yeah. you while she was helping you already. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, during this time, like I'm stuck at a hotel, a gambling hotel, a casino <laughs> in Laughlin, Nevada. And these are things I'd never seen before. It's like, huh? So I did a little gambling, you know, I did like all these, I'm bad now. Right. So right. I might as well do bad things. And, and I, um, I got a little tattoo <laughs> of, of, uh, sun, moon and stars because overall, even with all this craziness, I felt freedom for the first time in my life, like the sun, moon, and stars had all been handed to me. Like it did have a meaning to me. Yeah. Even that soon, I still felt so guilty, so bad, and so worthy of destruction and death. But but there was something about it that just felt so right, too. Yeah. So, so I talked to this therapist. Basically, he saw that I had a lot of issues with my mother because she was always very, you know, controlling and... She was the one that I tried to please all my life, but I could never please her. You know, she was, she's that type of mom. And, um, and my ex came with the baby or my husband at the time came with the baby. And he actually said to me, like, I showed him my tattoo. Like I'm very transparent. You'll see. (laughs) Um, I showed him my tattoo and he actually said, um, well, I'm going to kiss you there someday when you come back to Jehovah. And I said, nope, nope, I'm not (laughs) like, that wasn't even an option. I didn't want him to have hope. It was it was such a bizarre place to be mentally. Like I felt like I was fighting for my own life. You know, like um, I found a taste of freedom, and that's what I wanted. And yeah. it was it was very strange. So so I told my mom, like, nope, I'm not going back. Like she thought this would happen, and I would just go back, and it would just be fixed, just like that. And so what she did was left me in Laughlin, Nevada by myself with no, I had like, I don't even know if I had 20 bucks. I don't even know. She went home to Arizona. I had to fly out in Vegas an hour and a half away to get back to Oklahoma where I had a job and she abandoned me there. She did not care what happened to me. If I died, I died. I mean, it was like such a awful feeling. Like I felt truly abandoned and unloved and uncared about in the biggest way. So I ended up calling a cab company and I told them pretty much what happened. Like, and I'm stuck and I only have $20 and they ended up getting somebody off duty to come pick me up, which was really scary because it was a man and I felt like he was going to rape me. You know what I mean? You just think, those bad things are always happening. Like I was oh, yeah, pretty especially sure I'd coming be... from our, our, um, backgrounds, you know, yes. we were told to fear the outsiders. So <clears throat> yes, I thought I'd be raped they and were, murdered. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And, um, he picked me up early. So, uh, we had like two hours in Vegas and like, I had to get out of the car with him and like go in a casino. I was really scared. And I, I didn't even hardly talk. I was just like kind of hovering in the corner of his car and I, I'm sure he could tell like, uh, something's wrong. And, and he did not do anything to me, you know, um, he did take me back to the airport and I did make it, but that always will hurt when I think about it. Like that my mom really did not care what happened to me. I was abandoned in Laughlin, Nevada with nothing. You know, I mean, that would, that would hurt anybody. That's awful. She, yeah, that, and that sets the tone pretty much for how you're treated once you're shunned. You know? Yeah, yeah, you're just yeah. thrown away like common trash. Yep. You know. And I um I wrote a disassociation letter. I confessed everything that I did and turned it in and a few times the elders came and tried to talk to me and I just wouldn't talk to them. I knew that they would ask, you know, personal questions and stuff mm-hmm. that now I know how bad it really is when they do that, but I just felt like I don't want to be one, so I'm not going to talk to them. It probably so, would have just been further traumatizing. Yes, I can see that now. I did. Yeah. I definitely had good instincts to avoid that whole yes, thing. Yes, yes. So, um, so I, of course, everything went downhill. Like I had immature roommates that this 
this boy, this guy that I had slept with, like, knew. Like, they were all, I was 24, and they were all, like, 19, 20, like, um, recently out of high school and, like, this group. And, like, they, I was almost, like, uh, I was very interesting to them because I was 24 with a child and getting divorced, yet I was so immature as far as uh, just experience goes or knowing Mm -hmm. anything like like I mean it was I was very they loved like asking me things and and basically like laughing at me because I was so unaware of things but you know it was a little bit it was like uh two months of high school that I never got right there that's what I felt (laughs) like I was in (laughs) Uh, but that fell apart. The, you know, the roommates weren't responsible and all this stuff. And I ended up calling my real dad and asking him if I could move in with him. And he said, yes. So I moved to Kansas, which wasn't too far. And, um, Jason ended up filing for divorce and just full custody. And I didn't fight anything. I just went and signed it. Like I I had no fight for myself. You know, I knew I was unworthy and that's it. And I'm just getting what I deserve. So I signed her over to him and that was it. And he ended up moving back to Ohio with his family. Wow. So, so then reality, like my whole manic part kind of started dwindling, like reality was in. And I, I only can think of how I felt like I was in a movie. Like I felt like everything was, not real. Like nothing I did counted. Hmm. Nothing was real. Nothing mattered because we're all going to die. And I felt like I knew we were all going to be killed any day now, but I couldn't even help these people anymore. I couldn't explain it to them. Like, what am I supposed to say? Like, you should be a Jehovah's Witness, but I'm not being a Jehovah's Witness, but we're all going to die. And uh, I was driving to work one day and I heard an ad on the radio for um, a place that it was called charter as a charter mental hospital. And they said, you know, you can come here and, you know, if you need help, we're here for you. And I just drove straight there and I uh-huh. went in the waiting room <laughs> and uh, I heard them talking on the phone to someone like, yes, we have her here. We'll hold her here. I thought they were talking to my dad about me immediately. Like they could just see I was crazy, but it, it wasn't that. <laughs> so I met with somebody. I told them, everything I did. Like, I felt so much guilt. It's not even funny. I'm a whore. I'm a harlot. I'm, I'm following Satan. I, you know, just like everything I was told I was, that's what I believed, you know, and I'm as good as dead. And they referred me to uh, another therapist that I went to and, you know, therapists don't usually have a good hold on, you know, leaving a religion like that. So I felt like she gave me some good advice, but, um, you know, not, not exactly what I needed, but I don't know that anybody could, like, it's a journey that you have to go on. And I think that's why this ex Jehovah's Witness community is so important because this is what I needed, you know, having people like us talking you through and telling you it's going to be okay. And you're not crazy. But, um, but that therapist did talk to Jason and said, I think what's wrong with her is she is mourning for her daughter. Like she needs to see her daughter. At that point, he he hadn't let me see her. So, so he he agreed, and I was able to get her. And uh, she was two at the time, and just it was just so nice. Like she was awesome, and I felt really bonded. You know, at that at that time, like I was over all the depression and all that, and I just I just could not see living without her anymore. You know, it was just. Mm-hmm. It was just so like seeing like it's almost like waking up and finding, oh, I just did all this and here I am, you know, and um, I had a boyfriend at the time that was like, you know, uh, not the best choice because when you're in that kind of position, you're not you're not really uh, able to make good choices. (laughs) Sure. But, you know, a a decent person, but, you know, just a typical boyfriend and um. I had her for a couple weeks and she went back. And then uh, six months later, I went to see her in Ohio. And I actually called my ex and I said, okay, I'm willing to come back. I don't believe it. I don't believe it, but I'm going to, I would come back, be a Jehovah's Witness and just, you know, marry you again so I can have my daughter. And he said, 
I wish you'd told me this before because now I'm engaged. And it's like, it was a year and a half later, he was already engaged. And I said, to who? And he said, this girl, she was 17. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, you haven't learned? And there were things that he had told me, like, finally at the end, trying to, like, open up finally, that that I was just like, it was just too late for me at that time. And I said, does she know that? Yes, she knows everything about me. Like, it just felt uh, just like, um, I don't, I don't, I can't even explain exactly how it felt. It felt like a relief on the one hand, because at least I was willing to go back, you know, like it was in his hands now. Um, but also that, okay, now there's no hope and, um, that part's just done. And so, and so he did marry that girl and she became my daughter's mm-hmm. stepmom right then. Right. Like, yeah. So, um, so as time went on, I, I got her whenever I could and, um, still felt bad. I was starting to like, realize like this life is real and trying to like live life. Like you need to live to be successful and stuff, but it's very hard when you have no education and Mm -hmm. no way to get like decent jobs or anything. And, um, I ended up living in Texas with another ex Jehovah's witness friend of mine. She let me move in with her and her family. And, and she had been in a, she had had a really rough time of it too. So we were both like this messed up, these messed up ex Jehovah's witnesses that still felt guilty. So it wasn't, we really couldn't help each other through it at that time. But you know, she, she did help me out a lot at that time to, to move to Texas. And then I ended up meeting my husband now and um, I was like, I would tell him like my story and stuff. And, and he could tell from the way I talk, like I was still a Jehovah's witness. He'd be like, you're still a Jehovah's witness. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Like I am just fellowship. Like I am perceptive. Yeah. I I was like, I am anything but a Jehovah's witness. Like, trust me. Like that's why nobody will talk to me. And, and um, he saw like my anxiety, like uh, if, if uh, fighter jets would go over, I would be like, Oh my gosh, it's Armageddon. It's starting. Like I would really feel like that at any time. I still felt like the end was coming any day now. And I ended up, uh, we got married and I got pregnant with my second daughter and um, I was, you know, really happy. But of course it makes you think about, you know, what if they're right? And now I'm bringing another life into this. And, um, my mother ended up coming to visit when she was like four weeks old. And I was so excited. Like, like I told my husband, like, you know, she won't come. She will never talk to me. She won't see her, but she did. And I was like, Oh my gosh, my mom's coming. I couldn't wait to see her. And, uh, I, I cooked for her and painted her toenails. Like I really catered to her. Cause that's what I always did. And she, said to me while I was holding my baby, trying to feed her, she said, um, you know, you better come back to Jehovah or you and your baby and your husband are going to die. And I'm going to be in the paradise with your other daughter. And I just started bawling. I was hysterical. You know, it was, it was so, it was such an awful thing to say to somebody, you know, like, (laughs) The whole, both sides of it, like rubbing it in that she's going to live forever with my other kid and, and we're all going to be dead. And like, ha- that's so heartless. You they know, just have so no heartless. boundaries. <laughs> no. And she, she had also told me she would have stoned me to death if we were in Bible time. So those kind of things coming from your mom <laughs> wow. are just very damaging. Uh, so, so did you know that there, there was actually um, a Watchtower article, I think, um, and I, I don't remember what decade it was from, but they were lamenting in there that they couldn't kill people anymore. Oh (laughs) my gosh. You know, like, well, you know, we can shun them, but if, if this was Bible times, we could have stoned them to death or something like that. Man, the good old days. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. If only we could go back and be barbaric, you know, I mean, what a, I cannot believe your mom said that about stoning. That is wow. It's hurtful, you know, and when you still believe it, it really cuts you to the core even more, you know? Yeah, because you were still, you were physically out, mentally in. Yes, I didn't know that term, but that's exactly what I was. So, so my husband came home from work and found me crying in the bathroom and he, he luckily had enough like, um, 
Uh, he was raised, I think, like Lutheran or Methodist, Methodist, I believe. Like, not too extreme, but his first wife was an extreme Baptist. And so for a while in his life, he was, like, going to church all the time, um, teaching Bible studies until he saw the hypocrisy in that particular church, you know, and he mm -hmm. backed away. But he knew enough about the Bible that he told my mom, you know, you can't say that to her. Like the Bible says love. Love is the greatest thing. And and you need to guard your hearts. And this and my mom screamed at him, No, it doesn't. It says this. And <laughs> and I mean it was just it was insane. And he made her leave. And that was the last time that I really was around my mother. That was the last time. So she left a few magazines and stuff, and I told my husband, <laughs> I said, well, we're going to have to be Jehovah's Witnesses. And he said, okay, let's study then. Let's do some research, which was the best thing he could have done. You know, uh -huh. he he knew there was no way he was we were ever being Jehovah's Witnesses, but he knew that I had to see it. So I started off Smart with man. like... Yes, yeah, smart man. So I started off with like the magazines or the publications she left and like the weirdest thing happened. Like when I would read it, it was like a, like a tune in my head. You know how the way they talk and the way they write, it's different than anything else. Even the, yes. even the typing, the type, the type of print is different. So you're I, absolutely I right. That. Yeah. Nobody yeah. talks like that. <laughs> I no, used to ask my mom as a kid, I was like, how are kids supposed to identify with this? Like nobody talks like this. No one would speak to another human being like this. They have their own style. Yes. And, and that tune in your head. Wow. So it makes must have made you feel at home to kind of yes. go back to it. Exactly. It was like almost like a snake uh, tamer, you know, playing that flute. Like uh, kind of yeah. just, I mean, it really made me feel almost like in a weird, like I don't, it was very strange. Like I recognized that. Wow. and myself immediately. And, and he's like, my husband was like, um, why don't we just use the Bible? Cause the Bible is what you need to, you know, show me in, not these publications. Why do you need that? And I thought, well, how are we going to understand without somebody, you know, <laughs> like the whole thing Jehovah's Witnesses say yep. without someone to show me, like I'm too dumb to understand. So he said, let's just do the Bible. And I was like, okay. I was like, well, one thing clearly that the Bible talks about is the dead are conscious of nothing at all. And everybody else believes, you know, that everybody goes to heaven or hell. And he's like, okay, where does it say that? And I found it. And then he's like, okay, read around it. And it was amazing that <laughs> that whole scripture, the whole thing is talking about, you know, everything under the sun is vanity. And it's really about what it would be like if there was no God. And the person who wrote it was like in a depression. And it also said, uh, money is everything and wine makes the heart merry. And, and it was really like, oh, so that's not really what it's talking about. And that was eye opening. You know, that that little part was interesting to me. And then I remember there were a few other things that I said, well, the Bible says this. And he says, where? And I looked and looked and looked and looked and it didn't say it anywhere. Yet it was something that we were taught as fact, you know what I mean? Oh, I know so, what you mean. Yes. <laughs> the whole so context thing. thing, you know, they would always, Jehovah's Witnesses would always make fun of other religions and say, well, you know, if they just read the context around these verses, then they'd see that their teachings are false. And, you know, the same, uh, <laughs> they, yes. Yeah. It, it's them who, uh, you know, they have their own narrative and they are skewing verses and skewing contexts. Um, to, yes. to fit the story that they want to tell. And, you know, master trickers. Absolutely. I mean, yes. So, so those, that kind of got me started. So then I thought, oh my gosh, I don't even know what Jehovah's Witnesses believe, which was really bizarre to me because I felt like I knew everything, you right. know? So, so I actually got on the evil internet again and I looked up what do Jehovah's Witnesses believe, which was kind of weird. I thought, this is weird. I should know what they believe. But then I started reading, like, the whole thing about um, believing that Jesus is the mediator only for the 144,000 and where the Bible clearly says Jesus is the mediator for all mankind. And like, mm -hmm. so I started, so this, I was on my own. I was reading stuff and then reading why it was wrong. And there were different websites that um, I think other like 
Christian religions put out at that time, there wasn't a big ex Jehovah's Witness community at that time. So it was really with people trying to help Jehovah's Witnesses, which was really nice. And I was able to just find things out. And like, um, the whole thing about, I thought if, if Jesus was God, it should just say it plainly in the Bible. And then finding out that is what the Bible says. They just change it to a God, like Mm -hmm. so many things. And that, like, I remember one day it was like a light bulb went off in my head. And I would say, I, I literally felt the brainwashing leave. I said, I don't believe it. Oh my gosh. Like, I don't believe it anymore. I, I don't believe it. And it was from then on that I was able to start healing, you know, then I, I was able to, I, it was an obsession for probably six months of just oh, I'm sure. research and research and research and research and research. And then I found like, um, jwfacts.com, which was awesome because I still didn't want to read anything from bad people that had a, you know, a vendetta against Jehovah's Witnesses or paw states, you know, like that kind of thing. So that was a great tool to have just stuff that they said from their own mouths. And yeah, because JW at, Facts is all their own publications. Yes, it's yeah. an awesome resource. Mm-hmm. So I actually, in my total naivety, called my mom. And I said, mom, you're not going to believe this. Like, you're not going to believe what I found. You know, I said, who's your mediator? Who's your mediator? And she said, Jesus is my mediator. I said, but they don't teach that. They teach that. She got the furious. She said, you didn't come up with this on your own, which, you know, she didn't come up with the Jehovah's Witness stuff on her own. Well, but yeah, why does that matter? That is the dumbest know. thing. You know, I know. Well, you just yeah. got that from an apostate, so it doesn't count. If you got it on your own, then it would count. No, right. It's either I true know. or it's not. Exactly. And she she ended up hanging up on me, and I was like, wow. And then that's when I tried to get my stepdad to you know come in and help, and he and saw he was really tricked too. So that was out. But from that point on, I was able to help my daughter by carefully planting seeds. Like I told her one time, um, and she was definitely taught, you know, like one time she said, mom, you're like Satan. And I said, no, I'm not like Satan. Like it's a little too, you know, you're a little too young to understand, but someday I'll explain, but I'm not like Satan. Yes, you are. You know, those things were put in her head. She was taught to still respect me because I was her mother, but but definitely to write off anything I said because I'm like Satan. You know, it's a really sad way to see your child view you. And everything you say doesn't have any real merit because you're not saying what everybody around her is saying. But I was able to, like I said, um, you know what the Bible says? Like, um, take life's water free. Like, what does that mean? Like, what if I told you, you can have a free popsicle, but then I told you, you have to run around the house 20 times to get it. Would that still be free? (laughs) No. You know, it was like almost real basic things, but I was hoping it would plant seeds in her head. And um, we had a very close, great relationship. Like, she always said, like, she's just like me. And we're both a little crazy and a little wild and, you know, funny and um, just, just really we were bonded and we had text almost every day. And, um, uh, I feel like it was probably on my mind almost every hour of the day of how to help her to wake up, you know, yeah. like I couldn't say anything, uh, outwardly against them because I would worry that she wouldn't see me again, but I tried to instill critical thinking. Like I had her help her little sister with a, a school assignment, um, of, Like, let's say you look at this website for a product on the market that you see all these ads for, and everybody says, we love it. It's great. It's the best thing ever. You know, it's so worth the money. But then if you look at another website with balanced views and people who used it and bought it, then you can see, well, it broke after, you know, three days Mm -hmm. or the batteries run out or, you know, just like you can see, you have to have, or what's it called? Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. So I try to do it in a subtle ways. And I'd ask her like, what if when you grow up, you find out like everybody around you kept saying the sky is red. That's what it's called. It's called red. But then you find out everybody else thinks it's blue. Would you want to know? Or would you just want to keep thinking it's red? And she said, I'd want to know. So it was like, you know, I had like hopeful moments that, you know, hopefully she's getting this in her brain. But as she got closer to 18, 
I, I used to tell everybody like, she's going to have to stop talking to me. And they said, no, 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 she won't. Like, um, you guys are so close. I can't see that happening. Everybody, everybody said that. And it would really frustrate me because I know, you know, you oh, know, yeah. I know, yes. we know she was baptized at 11. Mm -hmm. So like I, I knew and she was, you know, she's raised in a very, very good Jehovah's witness family where, so my ex ended up moving in with his wife's family in a very, very small house with just one bathroom. They were like in an addition in the garage and he worked and pioneered. So they don't have much at all. And my daughter was like in a office off the kitchen that didn't even have real drywall. So they grew up, you know, she grew up with a lot of sacrifices in this life for yeah. the next life, you know, yep. that's their view. That's the new systems coming in and it was worth it. And I know they like, uh, her stepmom talked about my grandparents had a trailer with a fake rock around the bottom, you know? And she said, Oh, I love that look. Like someday I'm going to have a house with all that rock around it. And I thought, I know what she's talking about. She's talking about her mansion in the new system. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's how they think of things. They're, they're planning their future. Like we plan it by trying to save money and, you know, plan on what we can do as we retire and get older. They plan on their whole life being perfect in the future because Armageddon is coming. So, right. so I definitely knew how she was being raised and, and how it looked. And she seeing her dad treat her like they do on assembly parts, like, she doesn't like any kind of conflict or yelling. She likes things to be very calm, but you know, that's how she grew up where, okay, honey, let's sit down and read this Bible verse. So, you know, who is going <laughs> to soon take care of all the bad people, including your mother on the earth? Job, a good job. Like that's what she grew <laughs> up with and felt comfortable with, yeah, you know? So she's, yeah. and she has a lot of anxiety problems and stuff, just like typical witnesses yep. do. I did. So, yes, we all, we all did with that. So, and her, her stepmom has a lot of that too. So like, I could see her like following along, like, you know, everybody's sick in it because everybody's stressed out because having that weight on your shoulder of any day now it's Armageddon's coming. And if you slip up at all, you're going to be destroyed too. Like you can see the weight it really takes on people, you know, sitting back and just, wishing you could tell them you know yeah. you just want to help them yeah it's hard to live life with a guillotine hanging over your head you know knowing yes. that at any moment it might fall and chop your head off you know that's, yes. that's just a horrible way to it's live. kind of unpleasant yes. yeah. yeah 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 so um so the last time i had her um like i was getting desperate i was just like i can't lose her like i, can I can't imagine, imagine. Yeah. yeah i i i did not ever want to live my life without her and i knew her sister too would suffer. And we have, I have two stepdaughters that they wouldn't get to see her. You know, I knew how this would be. So like I had my sister saying, just go back, just go back. And, um, you know, it's easy. Like just go back and you know, it's not easy, but you mm. know, I thought I will do anything for her. I, if I can just get it changed in name, like I'm not doing anything bad. My life is very moral, just sure. a simple, happy family life. So I, I thought, you know, what the heck? And I'll just get that label changed and then I'll, I can fade out of it, you know? So, right. so I called the elders in this town and, um, had them come over and met my husband and my daughter. And, um, my husband knew, you know, it was definitely a plan. It wasn't legitimate, which I felt bad about, but then again, this is for my daughter. I'm sure. willing to do anything. So yeah, why they, should you feel bad? They're the ones holding your daughter hostage, right? But in their view, like I do worry about putting this out there because oh, you tried to trick me. You know what I mean? That they that's trick the hard uh, part. eight million people around the world. <laughs> yeah, that's why I know if if this is heard by my daughter or her family, right? They will be you know free to listen to it. So I hope that means that they will understand what I'm saying. You know? Right, right. So they came over and um they were very pleasant and my husband said like he didn't want me bringing my daughter to the meetings because he said she said you guys would shun her and nobody would talk to her. Is that true? And they're like, yes, yes. Well 
we have to take our time and see if your wife is clean. And I just thought, oh my gosh, I wish he could just <laughs> punch them now because <laughs> the nerve of saying that to a man yep. that they're going to judge your wife if she's clean, like, oh my gosh. So they said though, probably a couple months and I had heard differently, but I thought, well, I, you know, that's not too bad. <laughs> so I started going to the meetings and it was so hard. Like, um, I mean, even knowing what I was doing, it was just listening to it and the way that they talk about other people and how everybody's clueless. But that is just like, oh my gosh, it was so difficult. But, but I did it. And I found out later, like I was really too confident in myself. Like I should have been crying to them and, you know, begging them to forget. I should have acted differently, but uh-huh. it was almost like I couldn't be that inauthentic. So I was like a confident woman. I would sit in the front because the back seats were all taken. So I would go in and sit in the front. Like I have nothing to hide. I shouldn't have done that. Should have sat in the back. <laughs> but um, people came up to me and introduced themselves. I would say I'm disfellowship and they'd turn around and walk away. Like it was just like a very awkward situation. Like like it is for anybody trying to go back. And I'm glad I knew that, you know, this, this wasn't really me because being treated like that is so hurtful by a bunch of strangers. Um, so I did that for a couple months and then they were going to have a meeting with me on a Sunday and, um, I was like, okay, this is it. And, I hadn't gone to every meeting because on some Thursdays, uh, my husband had school and I couldn't bring my daughter and she was too little to be alone. So I'd call in. One brother gave me the number to call in. And so I sat with three brothers and two were the ones that had visited me. And then there was the, the, the bad cop, you know, the one brother that was like the bad cop and, and they were questioning me. And I mean, trying to see how sincere I was. Like I was, I didn't really know the point of the questions, but, um, the, the one brother said, like, and you haven't been to every meeting Thursday. And I said, well, you know, some of the meetings I listen to at home. And he's like, that number is not for you. And he was pointing in my face. That is for approved publishers only, not for you. And I was like, okay. And he's like, not for you. I mean, it was just like, oh, oh. well, he gave me the number, you know, but yeah. I was just like, okay, okay. They're such bullies. Yes. And they locked the door, which is really uncomfortable. Like three men and me in a locked room. Like, it was just like, ugh, in what world is this okay? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So then they had me go out and sit in the other room, and then when I came back in, they told me, you know, Jehovah may forgive you, but sometimes it takes the brothers longer, so we're going to give you a few more months, and then we'll meet back. (laughs) And at that time, I was like, I mean, I, I... it took everything I had to walk out calmly, but yeah. as soon as I saw my husband, I was like, I can't do it anymore. Like I, I tried, I tried and I could not do it anymore. So he, he did like leave a message with one of the guys and said, you know, you guys said it would be like two months. Like that's, that's a lie. And to treat somebody like that is, is not correct. Like I will not, she will not be coming back. I'm not going to allow her to, you know? So well, I just like to say that, you know, let's say that your daughter were to hear this and let's say that your daughter is still one of Jehovah's witnesses. OK, mm-hmm. and, and let's say that she stumbled upon this. What love would it take for her to go to a Baptist meeting <laughs> for mm-hmm. for months and pretend to be a Baptist or a Lutheran or a Catholic or whatever, you know, that she would view as, as not being, you know, correct Mm -hmm. to, to get a person back. I mean, what you did is extraordinary to be able to suck it up (laughs) and go into that environment when it's not what you believe. And to face the bullying abuse of those brothers all out of love for your daughter. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I tip my cap to you. <laughs> that, that is, I, I just, I don't think, I don't know that I could step back into a kingdom hall for anything. <laughs> Man. And, and it, it, it took you, it took you back. Like I hadn't been in like, like 20 years and it felt like 
yesterday, like the same talks, the same <laughs> information, the same repeat stuff, except there was a lot of new light. So all the truths had changed, right? but it was still taught like the same boring, self-righteous misinformation yeah. spewed, you know? And you know what, that's what it's going to be. And yet you put yourself in that position because you love your daughter. And yes. you wanted to have the freedom to see and speak to her. And I mean, just thinking about that, just just how an organization can can keep that from you, can force a young girl to to go against what might even be her own. And I imagine is her own individual feelings deep down if she were to actually think about it. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, underneath the indoctrination, underneath the rules. And I mm -hmm. was a good rule follower myself, but mm -hmm. underneath the rules, when my brother was disfellowshipped, I still knew like this, not talking to him thing is not right. This mm -hmm. hurts. It feels wrong. It, emotionally, it feels wrong. I'm only doing it to follow a rule. And if it feels wrong, you know, that's oftentimes your conscience, your body's way of telling you this isn't the right thing to do. And that's why so many people in the organization are so full of anxiety and depression, because emotionally underneath the indoctrination, they know this isn't right. This hurts. And, mm -hmm. and if it hurts, why is this the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. um, we all knew better on some level. Our, our humanity, our, our, our basic instinct was that this wasn't right. Um, but we did it because we were following rules established by an organization that had their best interest at heart, not necessarily mm -hmm. ours. And so I just, I, I, I feel for you, I mean, to, to be able to go into that situation, I mean, it was crazy. It you really get was. mom of the year. You know what I'm saying? I mean, to be able to, to sacrifice that much, to be able to go into that, to, you were willing to sacrifice who you were just to get mm -hmm. her back. And you know what I found? You cannot do that. Like, no. like you have to be yourself. So yes. like all extra was witnesses who yes. think of doing the same, like, you know, maybe some would have more success. And I've heard of the moms going back to save their kids, right. you know, to get them out. And some have been successful, but, but even if I had gone back now, like I think about how it would be like when she came to visit, I would have to pretend all yes. the time, like yes. the way that they talk all the time. Like when she knew I wasn't a witness, I didn't have to pretend to be a witness. So, so now it would be like, talking to my other daughter like oh look how beautiful this tree that Jehovah made was like right. it would just be so inauthentic and like trying to push my other daughter to go to meetings and I would still have to go to keep up appearances like yeah. the bottom line is it would not work but I I did still feel like I just had to try it because because if I didn't I felt like I would regret it I was right. just really grasping for straws and sure, at my wit's course. end like this like, was becoming desperate <laughs> again uh, yeah again it's it speaks to your sincerity I mean you were doing something insincerely you know in going trying to go back as far as you know being a witness but you were so sincere in your feelings for your daughter that you were willing to try something that goes against the very grain <laughs> Of, of, mm -hmm. of who you are, you know, just for her. And yes, and you think too, heck, they let child molesters back. Of course. That are not doing it for the right reasons. They're yeah. doing it to get their claws into more children. Yeah. But that doesn't prevent them. So it was like, you know, like for all really you know, a one person of the, like me. <laughs> yeah. For all you know, one of those elders who was like, um, Jehovah may forgive, but... But we humans sometimes have a hard time, harder time forgiving. For all you know, one of those elders who was sitting there in that room with you had molested a child at yes. some point or had done any number of awful things and come yes. back. But now he can lord that over you. Yes. You know, and an interesting thing, because I was talking to her about this stuff when um, when I was going through it and I told her I did tell her what happened, like this brother was very unkind. Like he was saying this and, you know, I was doing what I could do listening to the meeting. she said, 
well, he probably just had a bad day. Like, the brothers aren't perfect. Oh. And then um, my <laughs> ex-husband said um, uh, something about, well, I wouldn't worry too much about um, the brothers. Like, they do what Jehovah wants them to do. Because I'll tell you what, I've been in a position where I really felt like I knew the right decision. And then, by golly, Jehovah directed me another way. And I thought, well, that's not what I think, but Jehovah directed me and I thought that sure takes a lot I, I don't even know the word for it but to think that Jehovah is really in your head directing you yeah I mean <clears throat> that is just so surreal to me how but full that's of yourself how they can feel. you be yes exactly <laughs> God is God in my is head, in head and speaks yes. through me <laughs> yes yes yeah. so that's that's where he's at right now you know and, that level of yeah believing that he is you know Jehovah's hand is right on him and you it's know? and it's funny how or, or yeah funny whatever but yeah <laughs> it, it, it's ironic how Jehovah's Witnesses love to point out the quote imperfections of other religions as the reasons that they're not the truth, but yet when anything goes wrong in Jehovah's Witnesses organization, they're oh well we're just imperfect. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. well, wait a minute. I thought imperfection wasn't an excuse. Now, all of a sudden, it's an excuse for the organization. It's mm -hmm. it's not an excuse for for Lindy and why mm -hmm. she slept with this person, but or whatever, you know. Right. But it's an excuse for them to cover up and do all kinds of horrific things that hurt so many more people than you as an individual ever hurt or, you know, in anyone as an indiv individual has Jehovah's Witnesses have no problem using that label of imperfection to cover over so many sins that exist within their organization. Yep. It's just a cover up and different rules, yep, really, for them and everybody, everybody who's not a Jehovah's Witness, basically. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So, Absolutely. so one good thing during this time, she did come to visit me. Like we went to a meeting together, which, you know, she saw me shunned firsthand, which, you mm -hmm. know, it's just, just not a good thing for your kid to see, I feel no. like, you know, but, um, but that was the time where the Australian Royal Commission was going on. Oh. So my husband came home from work and he said, Hey, I saw your, you guys' religion in the news, something about, um, a Royal Commission. So I was like, Oh, really? So, I like looked it up and I said, Oh, huh, this is interesting. And I handed her the iPad, like, check that out. And she like read over it and you could tell it was like uncomfortable immediately for her. Sure. Cause it said, you know, over a thousand, um, abusers and not one reported to the police. And she's like, Oh, hmm. and then handed it back. And that was it. And then I also said, um, you know, you know, dad, her stepdad, uh, he has a membership to the Y and I wasn't sure if I should go or not, but I was doing some research and I found out, um, Jehovah's Witnesses were actually part of the United Nations so they could use the library for a while. So it seems like if they could do that, I could, you know, go to the Y for the pool. And she's like, Oh no, 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 no. They would never do that. They would never do that. I said, <laughs> Hmm, well, let me call your dad and ask. So I called him and I was like, Hi, you know, I was just looking up some things and I saw they were part of the United Nations for like 10 years. And he's like, oh, oh, that. Yes. Well, um, yeah, they thought, well, they need a membership to the research library. And then they kind of thought, oh, well, maybe this is a, such a good idea. Oh, so they stopped being it. I was like, uh huh. Yeah, so they they stopped being it like a week after, um, after they were exposed. somebody exposed them in the New yes. York. Post After 10 something. years. Yeah. 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 So, so I told Shaylee, I was like, uh, my daughter, I told her, well, um, yeah, your dad said that did happen. And she, you could tell it was just like, she was like, what? So the good thing is during that time, I was able to show her things that normally I would not have been able to show her. Yeah. So the, like pretending to go back was yeah. a success as far as that goes, because once you start seeing cracks, it's impossible to not see them. Like, how long it takes for those cracks to grow, I right. have no idea. But, you know, at least she saw that. So so she went home after that trip, and, and I had a feeling this is the last time I'll see her. Like, it was in the summer, and um, her birthday turning 18 was the following May. But I had planned one more big trip that I was really going to just 
show her more because it was like now I have nothing to lose but she actually called me like um, a month before she turned 18 and just said she was crying like I I hey babe what's up and she said oh I was like what's wrong what's wrong like I thought her cat died or something she said I can't talk to you anymore and I was like wait a minute wait a minute no you're not 18 yet you can still talk to me. Like we're going on this one trip and you're still going to do that. Like I was kind of like, no, 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 no. Like this, this can't happen. And, and she was like, no mom, you talk bad about the governing body and you can't do that. And, and I said, you know, I, I understand this and I knew this would happen because I know you don't have a choice. She said, yes, I do. It's my choice. This is my choice. Not talk to you anymore. And I said, Listen, I'm going to call your dad because you're still under 18, so you still have to respect me, and I'll call you right back. And I called him, and he, like, this, I felt like he really showed his true colors because before that I had called, I had talked to him before and apologized for what I put him through and for the way I went about things and, like, explained about, like, I really had postpartum depression, and I was just really sorry. He said, well, I'm sorry, too. Like, I wasn't perfect, and I'm sorry, too. And, you know, it seemed like, pretty good. And I thought, well, maybe he has a heart and he knows like, this would be devastating to our child to lose her mother, like devastating to a kid with already anxiety problems and already issues they're going through that needs a mom, you know? And he said, you had this coming, Lindy, this is all on you. And I was like, man, And I said, you know, Jesus would never shun anybody. And he said, you need to dig a little deeper. And it was just, it was just nasty. So, so I was like, you know, that was it. And I lost it, like hysterically crying, um, shaking. I mean, it was the worst day of my life. I put a post on Facebook, like this day, the day I dreaded finally happened. Like she'll never talk to me again. And her, uh, step grandma wrote me on Facebook, um, messaged me and said, how awful I was. I don't deserve Jehovah. I deserve to be destroyed. How I'm trying to make this all about me and it's about Shaylee. I mean, it was just Oh, she wrote that on Facebook? How, uh, t- a private message. Oh, of course. There you and go. I ended up writing her back calmly like three days later when I calmed down and just said, you know, um, I understand she had no choice. This is the way she was taught to believe and she thinks she's doing the right thing and she thinks it's out of love for me. And I understand that. And I hate that she's going through Like, I kind of like, I was showed like basically kindness. And then she wrote back, like, you should really come back. Like it was at first, you're not deserving. You should be killed. And then it's like, oh, you should come back. Like it was just so, they're so crazy what they're thinking. Yes. Crazy. Absolutely. So, um, it's all about them and how they feel in the moment. Yes. Yes. So much. I mean, and, and how proud she was of, of her daughter and, my ex and like, um, and it's like in the real world, like a man living with his in-laws in a little garage, you know, it's not exactly something to be proud of, but in that world it is because they've given everything up for this cult, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I went through a lot of mental anguish. I actually talked to a, a, a Steve Gut. Gutierrez, I think, as he's an ex Jehovah's Witness therapist. Like, I talked to him a few weeks up to this call, th- trying to prepare. And then the day it happened, I called him and it's like, there's nothing you can say. That's the hard part. Like, there's nobody that can really help you deal with this. It's yeah. just awful. And, um, I, I went through like weeks of just shaking. Like, I, I didn't even know how to process it. It was just like, this is the worst thing ever. And I can't believe. I can't just call her and say, like, this is wrong, like, because this, this, like, here's the facts. Like, it's so mind-blowing that we can't help people we love, that they, I mean, it's hard to even comprehend, really. It really is. It's a masterful job of manipulating the entire situation by the cult. I mean, they've they've got it set up to where they've got, (laughs) yeah, they've got you coming and going. There's no way to really be able to have these honest conversations because they just shut down and yes, or, shut down. Or I've seen so many times. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Get furious or shut down. Yeah. So, uh, so I, 
I kept thinking all these things I wish I could tell her, like the things that I was going to tell her. And I ended up doing YouTube videos for her. And that was so therapeutic because without that, like the thing, oh, I should tell her this. Well, I wish she knew this. I wish she knew that. And knowing that I will never know the right time for her to know these things. But if I put it on YouTube, then at her, like maybe some night she'll be alone in bed and thinking of me and she'll know these videos are out there and she'll look at them. Who knows? But, but I f- figure I can help other people cause I've been silent for so long, yeah. keeping my mouth shut about everything. Cause I didn't want it to get back. You know, I didn't want to be viewed as the apostate term, which I already knew was BS anyway. I already right. knew it wasn't anything bad, but, but I didn't want her to hear that word for me because I knew how she viewed it. But I, I did a lot of research for each video and organized them. And I hate being on camera, but I did it. And <laughs> hopefully someday she'll see him. I managed to be very calm, very, you know, fact. And, you know, we'll see what happens down the road with that. But, um, like now I, I felt this, uh, other level of freedom open up where I wasn't always, I wasn't faking part of my life, you know, like for her, like, mm-hmm not saying certain things that felt really freeing and good. Um, I was able to reconnect with my real dad because I think up to that point I was so consumed with my daughter and wanting to help her. I didn't have time to put in things that I needed. So my stepdad had passed away and my mom, you know, is out of the picture. So I have a real dad and, and I allowed myself to have that again. And that's been, very healing and good to have. And, um, I, I just hold out hope for my daughter to someday call me, you know, but I hear little things like she doesn't talk much to her sister anymore, which is devastating. You know, um, my, my youngest daughter, Megan, she's, she is so uh, just amazing. Like she's heard all this stuff for so long that when we, we went to Ohio to visit my grandparents and that's where my daughter is. And she met Megan for lunch and she made sure I was not going to be there. I was not going to come in. And that was like, yes, I know I'm not coming in, but my grandparents went to a different restaurant with me and I dropped off Megan for sister. And when Megan came out, I was like, so what did you guys talk about? And she was like, well, I brought up like, um, the blood, like the Bible says, I want mercy and not sacrifice. And, and she said, well, blood transfusions kill people too. And I brought up the child abuse and she said, well, that's only in one country and the media is just lying about it all. And she brought up, I mean, she brought up like seven subjects that I was just (laughs) like, I didn't even know she real she had a handle on all this, but she did. And And her sister kept saying, well, Megan, you're too young to understand. And she said, like, what's wrong with mom? Like, you were fine to talk to her before and now you can't. Like, she just loves you. I mean, she just went to bat for me and her sister. Like, she knows she's tricked. She doesn't take it personal. Like, I've explained to her from the time she was very little because this is a part of our family. You know, it's part of our life. So she she has she she doesn't internalize it or think it's her fault, but she wants to help her sister so much. So that was amazing. And um, and then I've, I've my my sister now has opened her eyes enough to like talk to her about it and say, like, you know, I'm not living that clean of a lifestyle. And you talk to me, you talk to your cousins who are like, you know, quote unquote bad. But you don't talk to your mom who's like living like the cleanest moral lifestyle of us all. Like that doesn't make sense. You hang out with other relatives that aren't witnesses and aren't, aren't even good association, like known to do drugs and get drunk all the time. Like it's just amazing how disfellowshipping or or shunning it's just to keep information from them, period. It yep. is not about your association or like, can you imagine a mom being bad association? Like, Hey, you should go do some drugs, honey. You know, <laughs> that's, that's ridiculous. It's, right. it's really all about the control. And yeah, you know, like you said, it's about information, you know, withholding information from these people. It's not about, um, it's not about anything more than that. It really nope. isn't. Nope. And now, and now she's getting married. I found out that like, she's not even 20. (laughs) 
Um, she's oh, well, getting she's married. a witness. <laughs> right. That's like, what we it's all no did. It's no surprise to me. It's funny. It's no surprise to me, but like my family who I've said, well, she'll probably be married by the right. time she's, but no, no. And then they're like, huh, wow, that's young. You know, like it's so yep. funny how everything I say, someday they'll believe me that I know what I'm talking about, you know, <laughs> but, mm-hmm. but, uh, yeah. So every time I hear stuff like that, it's though the knife just twists, like, like um, I heard Brenda talk about, you're never free from it because as long as you have people you love, I feel like they're chained inside the prison and yeah. I won't leave the prison walls because I will I will always be there in case she ever needs to come out. You know, as soon as she's ready, I am there. So you can't ever go far. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. That's absolutely correct. I mean, I think any of us that still have family in um, will always be connected to jehovah's witnesses or mm-hmm. the flds or mennonites or whatever culty religion you you know there is because we have to be um you know they've they've got our people in there yeah <laughs> and yep. and if we love them then you know we want to still be around to help them if if they need that or or whatever uh, which you know is such a it's such a contrast, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses proclaim to, you know, they profess that they, they have, you know, true love. Um, mm-hmm. They know what love is, um, but yet their love is so short, shorthanded. You know, they, they're quick to dismiss a person, to throw them away like trash. Yes. You know, whatever happened to the scripture in Corinthians about love, uh, believing all things, hoping all things, never failing, you know, their right. love is so easy to fail if you if you just say you know one of the questions that elders often want to ask anyone who's leaving is um do you still believe in the faithful and discreet slave and that the governing body uh, you know are those people like if if you answer no to that their love is gone yes (laughs) just like that it's that conditional and and yet you know here we are people who are being shunned who are being treated like crap by those that we cared for, but yet we would all welcome them back, you know, with open arms. Uh, they don't have to even change who they are, you know, Right. they just have to be open. That's it. The, the, yeah. My, my niece once said, like, I think she would talk to you if you just don't talk about the religion. And I said, I absolutely would not talk about sure. the religion if that was the case. Yeah. But it's not. And that's the point. That's yeah. why I'm talking about the religion, because yes. there's no way for me to have her in my life as long as she's in it. There's no way. No, not it does not all. matter. Right. <laughs> no. Um, toward the end, I know with my own family, toward the end of when we would we would hang out, um, you know, they knew not to discuss the religion anymore around me um i hadn't at that point i still believed in it all i just had a lot of bones to pick and Mm -hmm. and i I usually you know would try not to even say anything but they knew that if they brought up something like let's just say hating on the gays as my dad Mm -hmm. liked to say um (laughs) you know he would say something about quote the gays and and i would say well like you know you know, I would just say that they're not choosing that any more than you're choosing to be heterosexual. You know, I mm-hmm. would just, I had started to gain perspective on things. So they knew to shut that conversation down. So they just wouldn't talk about anything anymore. And like, we could still hang out, you know, but the sad thing is my wife and I noticed, and we would talk about it after we left, that the conversations were one-sided. It was just us because aside from being one of Jehovah's Witnesses, they have nothing else to talk about. That's so true. And, and it was yep. so sad. We would go over there, and my wife and I, we, when we would leave, you know, we were like, it's just not the same anymore. There, there's nothing to talk about because that's all they have. You know, We would talk about other things we were getting into or things that were interesting in life, and they just mm-hmm. really didn't have anything except for either talking about their beliefs or talking about the brothers and sisters in the kingdom hall. Oh yes. The gossip. <laughs> the gossip. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Other than that, they don't have anything else. Their life no. is completely one dimensional. And, and it, it, it's so sad that, you know, 
that's all they have. So, you know, like with you and your daughter, if you were around her, it's going to end up being about the religion because your daughter would have to bring that up at some point because that's just sadly what they have. It's, yep. it's, that's their, it's whole, their life. whole world, their whole self-esteem, yeah. like everything that it was for us when we were in it, it is for them. And, and they, they're not allowed to have any other aspects. So no. yeah, it's, it is very sad and very limiting. And and the one thing, like, I've noticed a lot of people really miss the fellowship, you know, that feeling of having a community. Right. And it's hard when you leave to not have that. But it's so important to realize that, like, like my husband brought up to me because I I'd said I missed that. Like, I missed that. And he's like, that's not normal. Like, what you experienced, that, that's not normal. And you can see it's not because it can be gone in the drop of a hat. It's yeah. like having a couple yeah. friends, a couple good friends, that's what's normal. So having a million worldwide brotherhood of friends that can drop you in a hot second or having two good friends, like what would you rather? Like the normal thing is just a, a couple good friends that will stick by you and, you know, really care about you and won't leave you or a fam your family, you know, just having your spouse that loves you unconditionally better than a million people loving you conditionally. So that's something like, I feel wow. like it's important for us all as ex Jehovah's witnesses to remember, like, yeah, you that just hit normal. me. <laughs> yeah. You just yeah. hit me. I'll be honest because, you know, I've even told my wife, I, I, um, I'm the kind of person I've always been the kind of person when I was a witness, I knew everybody and mm -hmm. um, a lot of people knew who I was. I didn't have it. I had a few close friends too. I, it's kind of, kind of strange. Um, at least when I was young, I had some close friends. And then as I got older, I had no close friends, um, but I knew everybody. Very typical. It, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I knew everybody and everybody knew me, but you know, as an ex Jehovah's witness, like I'm finding myself, like I have a lot of friends but I don't, I don't have a lot of super close friends. And, and honestly, I'm not a hundred percent sure that I know how to, <laughs> how to have super close friendships because in the organization, you just don't, mm -hmm. um, you don't have that many super close friends. Everything is conditional and having any real, uh, I don't know, intimacy. I don't know if that's the right word for a friendship, but any real closeness, that's, that's not something you have that often in the organization because, uh, everything is very um, shallow. It's shallow. You could get moved congregations at any time. And, and you always knew like if they moved you to a certain other congregation to help out or something like uh, you'd never see those people you were friends with before again. So true. Um, yeah. So it really does have an impact on even the way you see the world and, and life socially um, that is very hard to shake because those are the foundations that you were, you were built upon. Um, mm -hmm. So that's an excellent point. I love it when someone like yourself or I've had other guests on the show who maybe were married to someone who wasn't a witness or in a relationship and that person can see things um, in the witnesses like this, you know, with relationships, with friendships mm -hmm. that you and I, being from that have a hard time seeing because it's just the only lens we've ever had. Yeah. And it's normal to have a few buddies that maybe you met through work to go golfing with, but you don't know everything. Like they used to say at the meetings, like you should know the wallpaper in the brothers and sisters kitchens. You remember that? Like you <laughs> should know everybody that well that you know what wallpaper they have in their kitchen. Like, like it was a weird did. kind of thing, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, but you really weren't close. No. And, and when you looked at somebody, you knew if they leave, bam, gone. That's yeah. it. Like, so. And you were always so suspicious it, of them too, because bad association wasn't just outside in the world at large. Uh, right. Bad associates could be right, found right in the, in the kingdom hall with you. So you had to be so cautious around everybody and always yes. kind of looking with that side eye, <laughs> trying to yes. figure out what they were really up to. Yeah. So, so just have, but, but it is normal in life just to have friends that you enjoy hanging out with. Yeah. You don't have to be like, know everything they True. believe because it's exactly what you believe. Like True. there wasn't much mystery there with uh, being a Jehovah's witness with what exactly 
what they believe. <laughs> it's yeah. like exactly what you do or they wouldn't be there. Yeah, so. It was automatic, but it was very shallow. Those yeah, relationships, exactly. they were very yes. shallow. Very much so. So yeah, the, the stuff that we're experiencing today, if you have like one person that loves you unconditionally, you are, you know, you, you are on top of your game. And if you have a few friends to hang out with, like that's pretty much normal. Yeah. And we just have to realize that <laughs> yeah. and it's fulfilling though. It really is like, you don't, it doesn't leave you longing for things like with my second daughter, Megan, I always felt so bad. She doesn't have a grandma. But she has a mom and a dad that love her unconditionally, yeah. and she's happy as can be, and she doesn't oh, yeah. miss that. She doesn't miss having a grandma that would love her conditionally. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really eye-opening to see that somebody who hasn't been in that doesn't even miss it because it's not normal. <laughs> yeah, very true, very true. Yeah. Well, yeah. are there any ways, um, you know, that you're, you know, speaking about you specifically – you know, we're talking about the, the, the friendship and relationship aspect, but are there any other ways that, that you find that, you know, your past life as one of Jehovah's Witnesses kind of still impacts you? Oh, there are all kinds of weird things that come up. Like, um, <laughs> like my stepdaughter was watching a TV show, a very popular TV show about, um, the dead that are walking <laughs> <laughs> and she was yeah. like 15 and I was like, um, I don't think she should be watching that because like, what will that lead to? You know, she watches right. that when she's 15. What's she going to be? Is she going to be eating people by the time she's 17? <laughs> and then I thought, wait a minute. Like, I don't really believe this. Like, it's it's funny the things that your mind kind of reverts back to. and But it's fun, too, to discover, oh, that isn't me. I'm not that judgmental. Right. You know, that that doesn't lead to that. That's, you know, it's just like taking things a lot lighter is so important. and and. And I love not judging people. I love that. I think that's that's who I am on the inside. And like, I've I've always hated like we're not supposed to judge in the religion, but you do. You oh, judge everybody. Yes. Yes. So not having that is just just incredibly freeing, and not having the guilt for every little thing that you do. That is so nice. Yes. So, and I I think by now I pretty much have been able to. Um, like let most of it go. But like the whole thing with Trump saying peace and security, I had to refresh my memory on why that doesn't mean it's been declared peace and security. And now the end's going to come like some things still get me and it shocks me when it happens. Like, you know, like, yeah. thank goodness we have all the extra Jehovah's witnesses to turn to that say, Oh, well, this has been said a million times. Ha ha. Yeah. It's like, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. For those, okay. for those who are listening, <laughs> who, who aren't, affiliated with the witnesses um there's a scripture that says something about uh there would be a cry of peace and security and then sudden destruction is to be instantly upon you and so jehovah's witnesses uh believe that that verse to mean that there's going to be some sort of a cry now this cry can either be um we want peace and security because things are so awful or um, that was originally what they said but then to hedge their bets, <laughs> they also yeah. said that it could be, well, it could just be a cry that, hey, we've achieved peace and security, and then Armageddon will start. So so whether things look good or whether things look bleak, <laughs> they've got it covered. As long as the word peace and security is in there, then that is when sudden destruction is to be instantly upon us as humankind. Now, of course, 1986 was the International Year of Peace and Security. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And somehow we're still here in 2018. Um, I mean, you yeah. can't get much more of a cry than a than the International Year of Peace and Security, where commemorative coins were made for it. Um, but now, anytime any world leader says the words peace or security, uh, suddenly witnesses get freaked out, thinking that Armageddon's about to come. And so, I mean, I I've seen on some of the forums and such, sometimes ex witnesses, you know, like yourself, others. You know, even just hearing that, because we were taught that that was a trigger for Armageddon. Yes. You know, it's just so embedded in our psyche that we hear something like that. And it's like, oh, crap. What if they were right? Yes. <laughs> and they did that because they do want it on your brain all the time. Right. Anything could be the start of Armageddon. There was right. one funny thing that happened when I was a kid. I think I was like 13 and I was babysitting. Uh, a bunch of little kids in a house in Las Vegas, and I heard this big boom, like this huge boom, and I thought, 
this is Armageddon. And I, I tried to stay very calm with the children and like, but my mind, I was like, Oh my gosh, it's starting. And it was, um, it was a blow up at the marshmallow factory. So darn, <laughs> not Armageddon, but, but it just shows how it's on your mind all the time. All the time. Yes, absolutely. Armageddon any second. Well, yeah. I would say that a world without marshmallows <laughs> might be as good as Armageddon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was even worse than I thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, it is funny, though, how those little things, you know, and I, I still find them, too, little things that'll creep up. Um, or just even you now from me, I, I don't, I, I have a hard time even watching things that are like very violent or, um, uh, you know, because I just, I wasn't around it. So, so it, mm-hmm. it, I, I'm very sensitive to that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. but you know, I'm, then again, I know of a lot of my ex witness friends who watch all kinds of things that, you know, that go, you know, very violent or whatever, that, yeah, and as I'm, I'm happy for them because I wish I could get, get beyond some of that stuff, you know. That, but I think we've all got our, our things. And you know, um, it's okay to be like. That's another thing. Like we're not all the same. Some yeah, personalities yeah. can't handle it. For sure. Some don't enjoy that stress for sure. and anxiety of that. So, so, and it's okay. It's okay if you enjoy it. It's okay if you don't. Like right, right. that's the the lovely thing about being free and being yourself, and you can figure that out. You know. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. It's great. Mm-hmm. Um, if you could say anything to your family and friends that shun you, is there anything that you would say? Um, I mean, maybe, is there anything you would say specifically to your daughter or to anyone else? What I would say to my daughter is I love you so much and I'm here for you no matter what. Like there will never be a time that I'm done with you that I feel like it's crossed the line. Like if you ever come to me, I am here with open arms, no matter what your situation is. And that is what unconditional love is. And that's the kind of love I've always had for you and always will. And, and I hope that someday you understand like all the things that happened and why, because they had nothing to do with my love for you, even though it hurts to have your mom leave and it hurts to feel like you weren't good enough to come back to a religion for, but it had nothing to do with that. And, and I will always love you. And I always think if I pass away or something happens and she gets out and regrets it, I want her to know that I always know she loves me, even if she can't show it. So that's what I would tell her. Well, that's, that's beautiful. Um, I think... And I just miss her so much. Like I, I don't cry much. I try not to cry much, but there are times that I just cry all day because there's not a day that goes by that I don't miss her, you know? Yeah. I mean, sh- I think one of the worst things about shunning is that the person isn't dead. They're just treated that way. They're oh still my there, gosh, yes. you know, so and, hard. And so, I mean, I guess on one side, it, it you can still hold out some hope. Um, but you know, hope, well, Oh, wow. I guess I'm going to quote the scripture that they used to talk (laughs) about that hope deferred makes the heart sick, you know, and and it's true. (laughs) Oh, I hate that. I said that. There are some good quotes in there. (laughs) There are some in there, (laughs) but it's true. You know, um, when, when hope is deferred, it hurts. And, um, and, you know, obviously, you know, you're going to miss her and, and until that day comes. And, you know, I think what you said was beautiful. You know that deep down she loves you. Um, she's mm-hmm. she's currently a victim of circumstance. And, um, you know, hopefully someday, hopefully someday that will change. That's the hope that we used to always hold out for. You know, when we were witnesses, I used to hold out that hope for my brother who was this fellowship that yeah maybe someday he would come back and now look at now it's me that's out <laughs> i know isn't it you know with isn't him, it so, so weird that yeah. we used to think that though like yeah we hope you come back to our little bubble come right. in the bubble instead of us going to where the real world is like it's just right. so funny to have both perspectives yeah. of we were how the things ones, really are right we were the ones yeah. choosing to shun them they never chose I to know. shun us but we're hoping they do something different <laughs> I yeah know. it's so crazy so silly yeah um, it really is is there anything you've learned since leaving the cult that uh, has impacted your life for the better 
Um, I mean, just everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, you've you know, got the freedom of nothing else. Yes, the freedom, feeling authentic and real, being right. able to love without restrictions and not have guilt for nothing. That um, one thing I've enjoyed. It's it's weird. Like when you're a witness, you always want paradise, paradise, paradise. Like that's what you're hoping for. And when now I look out the window, I'm like, this is paradise. Like <laughs> going to the yeah. beach and spending the day on the ocean and finding shells. I mean, just little simple things that you don't have much time for as a Jehovah's witness that I enjoy it so much, you know, just those, those kinds of things. And, um, just learning to be, to really think critically about everything has made me just a better person. Like I've really honed in on those skills and, and able to think things through and trust my own gut. Like that is something so important. Cause like when I first left and anybody who first leaves, will have issues with that because you're told oh, yeah. all your life you cannot lean upon your own understanding or you have, you know, your heart is treacherous and, and, you know, you have to have somebody telling you what to do, but we are born with these natural instincts that will help us along the way. And learning to trust that has been really, really just a great feeling and confidence in yourself. Like that's okay. Just, just so much. I mean, is there anything that, you know, I, I appreciated how you brought out that, you know, even like the little things like going to the beach and collecting shells, like you've, your life now is more precious because this yes. is the life you have. Not that, not this promised paradise in the future or whatever, but this is what you have. Yes. And and so, you know, it's, it's a, a carpe diem situation. Um, is there anything else that, that you really enjoy? Anything you've been able to do or, um, are there any dreams even that you have for your new life? You know, um, since like, I felt like I was held down for a long time until my daughter actually left and, you know, going through that process. Um, I, I think right now my focus is a lot on being the mom to my 12 year old. Like it's so nice. Oh, I do love raising her knowing there's no cult, you know, there's no, yeah. she, she can be herself and seeing her blossom in that and seeing what a wonderful human she is. It, it's made me feel like, okay, I am a good mom. Cause that was something that I, I was scared to even have another child. Like I might leave that child too, you know, that I might do the same thing, but it's been a totally different experience and, and having woke up right when she was born, it was wonderful, you know, to be able to come out of that and her, be able to see me confident and she admires, you know, what I do and supports me and, you know, getting the story out there. She's, she's really an incredible little person. So that's a, that's, that's my thing right now is just raising her and being a good, good family person like that song, um, three doors down. If I could be like that, I would hear it. And it said, um, just a warm house on a quiet little street. Like that's all I wanted. I wanted to find that because it was so hard being a witness thinking Armageddon's going to come kill some of your relatives that you love. You know, you're going to be in paradise, but aren't you going to miss them? No, Jehovah's going to make you forget them. Like all that was a constant stress. And then leaving was a very stressful time. And I just would listen to that song over and over. And then uh, last year on my birthday, it came on the radio as we left the restaurant and I just started bawling because <laughs> I have that, you know, yeah. that's, that's my life. So, so my focus has kind of been like, you know, getting like being free to talk and using that outlet and trying to help people. And, um, sometimes I think maybe I would like to, um, uh, be some kind of, counselor or therapist for other people exiting cults. Cause I think there needs to be more help for that. Cause it's like, it takes an average of seven years I've read to really figure things out. And that was about the length for me. So I would love to just explore more of that once my daughter's older, you know? Yeah. That's, that's a, a beautiful goal to have. I, I've thought about that myself. <laughs> yes. And you're doing a wonderful job. What you're doing is that. So, well, thank you. I mean, yeah, you are. It's awesome. Well, yeah. I, I'm um, in awe of your story. I think that it's, um, it's just so impactful, you know, what you went through. And um, I think one of the things that shines through in all of it is your sincerity. And I, I just think that's, that's a beautiful quality. 
um, you know, that as long as you can be a sincere person and stay wrong, uh, away from the wrong influences, <laughs> you mm-hmm. can, uh, you know, you can turn that into anything. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I think that I know myself, that's, that's something that, that I'm working on too. You know, when, once you leave a cult, you have to take all that energy and all that sincerity and channel it somewhere, you know, figure out where to put that. And I think it's beautiful that you're, you know, you've got that cozy little home now and, you know, you've got family and you've got your friends. And I just think that's so great. And I hope that, uh, that, you know, who knows, maybe someday your daughter can even come and and, and join in the fun. I really, I hope so. That would be a day. I mean, people ask me on my YouTube channel, like, has, have you heard anything? Like, nope. But trust me, the day it happens, it will be announced. Like, <laughs> I will shout it out, you know, if I, if it ever happens. And and I have that reality that it may not, like, sure. that is the fact. And that yeah. is what, like, that's a hard thing to face. And every single parent or every single person who's lost their parent, I mean, all of us, all of yeah. us who've left these controlling religions know that is a big possibility. And to say like, oh, just don't give up or that, that's not really fair to us because there's a big possibility that it won't happen. And it, and that happens to a lot of people. So what I think is important is we have to go at, go ahead and give yourself permission to take care of yourself and to live the happiest, best life you can. Because if they ever do come, we want to be like, not devastated, not torn down, not ruined. Like you ruined my life. I've lived 20 years without you. Do you know what this has done to me? Like I haven't been able to be a mom to the other kid. I've been, you know, uh, neglecting my husband. Like, no, we have to be strong and be there for them. So that's one thing that kept me going is like, okay, I'm going to do the best I can to be happy and healthy myself so that when she comes to me, it can be helping her, you know, that's, That's Yeah, that's something we all, and and it takes permission to do that because we always want to put others for, like, there's there's a thing of, like, self-martyrdom that we all grew up with, too, that we don't want to let that influence us today. We're worth it. It's okay. It's okay to be happy and and do the best thing for ourselves. That's that's what we're here for, you know, this everyday life. This is, each day you have is the one you're guaranteed, so make the most of that, you know? As always, I want to thank Lindy for being so open about her life, the ups and downs, the good and the bad, and I'm so glad that she's been able to carve out a good life for herself and her family, and I hope that maybe someday her daughter that's still in can open her eyes uh, and maybe see what she's missing out on. Uh, You know, I know it won't be easy for her either if that time comes. You know, once a life is touched by the cult, there's not really a lot of easy choices, but uh, there's always hope and freedom's a beautiful thing. So we hope that she finds that too. If you'd like to leave a nice message for Lindy, you can do so in a couple ways. Uh, you can go to shunpodcast.com and you can find her episode on the episodes page and leave a comment of support there. Uh, you can also join over a hundred of us, our own little, our own little congregation of sorts, uh, at the new Facebook group called Shun Podcast. It's a private group, uh, and we do some fun things in there. We share quotes that we like, uh, talk about self-care, share music, uh, try to make it a positive place for those of us to land after leaving these controlling groups. Uh, Lindy's actually in there, too, and you can leave her a comment on the post that I'll make for the episode, so uh, you'll know that she sees it. You can also find the podcast on YouTube under the channel called Shun Podcast, one word, uh, you can also find us on Instagram at Shun Podcast, also one word, and on Twitter at Shun Podcast. Guess, yes, it's one word. <laughs> um, if you'd like to hear my story and a great insight into how the cult of Jehovah's Witnesses works, you can do so at the podcast called This JW Life, uh, also found at thisjwlife.com. Uh, we don't have any new supporters for the show this month. Uh, but you can always go to patreon.com slash shunned and support the show there for as little as a dollar a month. Uh, I've been getting all the transcripts done and up for the episodes, so um, those are all on the website now. Uh, speaking of episodes, I'm back at the regular schedule now. Uh, you know, the, the past two months I've done some uh, extra episodes, 
I released, I think it was five episodes instead of my normal one a month. Uh, so it's been kind of crazy. Um, it's been fun at the same time. I've done a lot of interviews as well. And I'm kind of looking forward to getting back to the regular schedule for now. Um, another great way that you can support both the Shun podcast and this JW Life is to head over to iTunes and leave a five-star review for them. Uh, it helps them to get found in the searches over there so that more people can find it. <laughs> you know, I, I actually just uh, got an email this week from a guy that is currently on episode four of this JW Life, and he's dealing with complex PTSD after leaving the cult. And, you know, the shunning and just everything that comes along with it. And he said he's being helped by the podcast. So, you know, as he makes his way through, I'm sure at some point uh, I'll get an email from him. Uh, hopefully he'll join us on Shunned as he, you know, eventually gets around to this, maybe even this episode. <laughs> and I'm sure I'll probably get an email saying, hey, that's me. So, um, yes, we're talking about you. And uh, we hope that, uh, you know, you feel better over time. And we're glad that the podcast can help. So, you know, any little thing you can do, uh, whether it's supporting financially or with a review or just telling a friend, uh, you never know whose life it might help. Um, I've been bad about remembering to include the songs that people chose to represent their journeys uh, at the end here. Uh, so Lindy chose the song, If I Could Be Like That, by Three Doors Down. Uh, it's a great choice if I do say so myself. Uh, go to the website. You'll see things that impacted her listed on her episode post. Uh, you'll also see a link to the song. And uh, actually, if you're on a podcast app, you can probably see all of the relevant information in the description on your uh, app as well. The song that opens and closes every episode of Shun now is No Hell Yet by Fair Voyeur. And I've been getting some good comments about the song. Uh, must be kind of an earworm. Seems it kind of sticks in your head a bit. Um, the artist is actually an ex-witness herself, and uh, we relayed some of the comments to her, and she was absolutely thrilled to hear them. So uh, feel free, if, if you like the song, uh, feel free to, uh, you can say so in the Facebook group. You can shoot me a, a private message on Facebook if you're a friend. Uh, send me an email, uh, shunpodcast at gmail.com, whatever, whatever floats your boat. But, uh, you know, she likes hearing um, that people are enjoying her music as well. And so I forward those on to her. So until next month, love others, do no harm, and go be happy. God and die. Believe me, I've tried.